Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Entembe City Independent Food Systems Dialogue. And um, that is titled The Significance of Lake Victoria to Entembe's Food System, Exploring the Opportunities for Food Security, Improved Livelihoods, and Environmental Sustainability Outcomes. Before we begin, may I remind you of the protocols for this dialogue? Uh, this session is being recorded, and by participating in this dialogue, you are given the consent to be recorded. Um, when we get to the breakout rooms, uh, we invite you to please um, discuss, to unmute yourself, and to contribute to the discussion in the breakout rooms. We also have the chat box um, there, where you can also uh, use to discuss and to raise uh, succinct issues that are significant to this dialogue. My name is Daniel Adeni. I am a professional officer with, with, with ICLI Africa. And it's my privilege to be here today with our colleagues from Uganda. I hope to welcome everyone to this session. And I believe it's going to be a very engaging and informative session. So I want to say, sit back and relax. Grab a cup of coffee, even as we take you on a ride to discussing the Entebbe City food systems. Um, I'd like to also take you through the agenda that we have for today. Um, we'll start with the welcome and introductory remarks. And after that, we are going to go into the setting of the scene where we attempt to concept, contextualize um, a team based food system and uh, the significance of Lake Victoria in a team based food system. After these sessions, where we will listen to some uh, presentations, we are going to go into a, a session of discussion factual breakout discussion, where you can also participate and give your voice to proceedings and, 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 and to issues um, revolving around the Lake Victoria um, Etebase food system. After that, we are going to get back and um, the facilitators will report back to the plenary. Uh, they, will, they will summarize what the discussions have been about, and there will also be a session of question and answer. From there, we are going to listen to uh, the city's commitment. Uh, we will hear back from the city about their actions and commitment, what they are committing to the UNFSS process. And after that, um, we are going to round off the session. I believe it's going to be an engaging and informative session. Um, I've introduced myself. I am at Daniel Adeni with Hickley Africa. And we have also, that we'll be speaking, the Honorable Mayor of Etembe City, and also my colleague, um, Solofina Nekesa. Uh, we have Mr. Samson Semakula from Etembe City, and we have Richard Kimboa from Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development, and Mercy Sebuliba from Lake Victoria Region Local Authorities Cooperation. Um, we cannot uh, but acknowledge our partners that have made it possible for us to organize this dialogue. Uh, they have been immense, their support has been immense in, in facilitating and seeing that this dialogue that we are having today is taking place. Uh, we want to acknowledge the support of FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, also ICLE Africa. We acknowledge the support of Entembe Municipal Council, and we want to say that without them, we cannot be gathered here together today. We also acknowledge the support of Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development, and as well as Lake Victoria Region Local Authorities Cooperation. We want to say thank you for making this possible today. Um, right about now, we are moving ahead with the discussion, uh, with the dialogue, and we want to invite the mayor of Etimbe, or by adventure, if it's represented, if the mayor is not here, to give the official opening of the dialogue. Over to you. Um, do we have the representative of the mayor around? Maybe here I would like to invite uh, Mr. Samakula from Entebbe City to, to, to give an opening and also contextualize us um, in this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Zorofina. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. clearly. Clearly we can hear Hello. you, Mr. Samakula. Good morning from Entebbe. 
and uh, thank you for coming for this dialogue. Uh, we have an issue with the COVID-19 in Entebbe, and the uh, offices are right now closed. So I'm actually operating from the market, which is safer than the office. And we, we have not been able to, to get the mayor to come and open the, the meeting. And we are also in a transition. We are moving from one mayor to, to the other. So the new mayor has not actually settled into office as yet. So he is not very available as of now. But he, both mayors bring their regards to, to the dialogue, the outgoing and the incoming, and they wish us good deliberations. And uh, to confirm the participation of Love Love and the uh, uh, Coalition for Sustainable Development. So they wish you a good stay and deliberations, and we shall be interacting. Maybe they will, they will drop by, I don't know, but they will drop by later on and have a word. Thank you very much, and welcome to the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sebakula, for that uh, opening remarks uh, from the city of Etembe. Uh, it is well received, and, and we implore everyone to just relax and uh, contribute as it were, using the chat box and also when we get to the discussion room. So I'm just basically now going to give the introductory remarks to the 2021 Africa City Food Exchange. I'm trying to contextualize uh, the importance of this and, and why it is relevant that we are having this. Um, so just a little brief about ICLE, ICLE Africa. Um, ICLE was founded in 1990 uh, with the idea that a single municipality has a significant impact and that cumulative local actions can achieve tangible improvements in global sustainability. So essentially, ICLE uh, focuses on sustainability issues um, in our local governments and cities. In other words, what we have realized over the years is that um, there is a lot of concentration on national issues. Even in global fora, we see that national governments, national representatives, they are always represented. However, cities and local government are basically underrepresented. So we try to represent them. We tend to represent them in, in um, international fora. And we also try to address the issues that uh, the sustainability issues that our local governments are, are, are facing. And um, we also under, uh, undertake um, sustainability projects to basically just give voices to our local government and cities and to address the issues uh, they are facing relating to sustainable development. And so a little bit background on the urban food system dialogues. Um, with the support of FAO, Weekly Africa has been organizing dialogues in 16 African cities. We have our dialogues in Cape Town, in Accra, in Nairobi, and in some other cities all across Africa. And the objectives of dialogues are, are this. Number one, we want to highlight the role that local governments, African local governments are playing in improving their food systems. And then number two, we want to generate discussions, uh, actions and commitment from our local governments on food system reforms. The dialogues are also essentially being um, organized and, and we are trying to connect it and link it together to, with the national uh, food dialogues. As we all know that this year is a year of, um, of dialogues, UNFSS process. And so there are national dialogues taking place. So the idea is to connect these local level dialogues and city level dialogues to these national dialogues. And also um, number four, finally, the last but not the least is to achieve elastic collaboration on urban food systems and strengthen networks for learning. So the idea is to bring stakeholders together to speak to the food system issues and also to profile solutions to, these, uh, to the challenges together uh, through collaborations, through actions. These are the objectives of the dialogues. And essentially we have started this uh, earlier in the year and uh, we've broken them down into phases. Phase one is engagements across cities, just we are, like we are doing now. And I think I've highlighted some of the cities where these engagements have been taking place in form of dialogues. 
Phase two is sharing and co-learning across cities. And, and this is I, I aligned with the, what, what we have termed um, the African City Food Month campaign. The campaign is, is running all across July. And so we, we are trying to also bring cities that we're engaging together in the form of city to city exchange so that they can learn from each other and, and they can offer solutions to challenges that, that, that they are facing. And all of these is expected, all of these are expected to contribute to the UNFSS summit that is coming up. The pre-summit is coming up in, uh, in, in June, in July, and then we have the main summit in, in September. And eventually also to continue that process. That's why we have the post-summit engagement. Um, of course, we are also familiar with the UNFSS action tracks. Uh, where we are trying to uh, where we are trying to align the objectives of all these dialogues to these action tracks and to see that we uh, we tackle all these action tracks. The first one is to ensure access to food and safe and nutritious food for all. Action track two speaks to sustainable consumption patterns. Action track three is to boost nature positive production. Action track four is to advance equitable livelihoods and five is to build resilience to, to vulnerabilities, shocks, and stresses. So essentially, the UNFSS process and the dialogue process is to give voices to stakeholders, to give voices to food system actors, and to ensure that their voices are heard and, and they, they contribute to, wait, to the ways in which we can um, move the food system forward and, and transform our food system to one that is resilient and sustainable. Um, without, so, so essentially, I, I've tried to concept, to contextualize what the UNFSS process and what these dialogues uh, tend to do, is that to give voices to our stakeholders to ensure that uh, they also contribute also and their voices are heard in terms of the way we can move forward, we can move the food system forward. And um, we are going ahead now to, to uh, uh, in this dialogue, and I want to invite um, Richard Kimboa to give uh, introductory remarks on the Entebbe Dialogue. Mr. Richard Kimboa. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and also the representative from the mayor, and also Iklai, uh, Lavrak, and the other partners that have provided in this very important discussion. You, you. Uh, do you have a presentation so that I can stop sharing or you just speak? No, no, I don't, I don't have a presentation. I just Great, please, you can continue, sir. Yes, sir. So we, we, as you've got a coalition for sustainable development, I'm very proud to be associated with this uh, process as it is part of our road mandate to, to, to promote sustainable development in Uganda, but also in, the, in, in this region in East Africa. So uh, contributing to the FSS dialogue, especially in the context of Lake Victoria, is a key area for us because in our other, our other uh, engagements, we deal with, with actors in the Lake Victoria region in Kenya and Tanzania. So it comes in handy. Uh, we have noted the, the goal of the, 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 this uh, dialogue, and we are very much uh, in, in to see what the outcome would be. We are particularly interested in action track three, which are to boosting nature positive production as opposed to uh, negative, but also action five, building resilience, shocks, uh, to vulnerability, shocks and stress. We acknowledge the national process, for example, already in Uganda, that is happening, uh, that is being undertaken by the Office of the Prime Minister and line ministries, are, as well as with NGOs uh, that are part of it, like the Food Rights Alliance, WASNET, that are co to contribute to the FSS, the UNFSS, by discussing their role in this in food systems, reflecting on new forms of, of joint action, and also, but also looking at what Uganda's development agenda is, as well as the commitments that Uganda has to the global uh, community in, in terms of the UNFCC, the climate change, the Convention on Combat to Combat Desertification, the Convention on Biodiversity and the SDGs. So uh, in, in, in November, uh, December 2020, UCSD uh, facilitated four training sessions in Entebbe for vulnerable households uh, through women and youth groups uh, that were meant to build resilience uh, through nature-based solutions. But one of the interesting things that, that, that we did with Entebbe and uh, ICLAI with their support or partnership 
was that we realized the enthusiasm that communities have to, uh, to, to offset what they are facing. Because that, that moment, we had just come out of the COVID-19 lockdown. And then there was this water level rise that was still, uh, actually even now, it's still affecting them. So they were very, very enthusiastic to see how can they get out of this. And it was very touching because you could see people are yearning for, for knowledge, they are yearning for opportunities. So in a way, this emphasis maybe provides also another opportunity to see how can we can really scale up this. But also groups, uh, so the groups have sustained uh, some of these uh, skills that we provided, for, like vegetable growing in urban settings. For me, for us, you see that is, a, is an important step because then it helps to supply food and uh, also to build resilience in terms of food, food production. Uh, for, for the moment now, we are in a, as in Mr. Smakura has mentioned, we are, we are in a second lockdown. Means that those that, that were able to start off with this uh, vegetable grow, growing probably are, are probably more resilient than those that have nothing. So, but also it opened up or strengthened uh, the same groups to work together. There's a group in uh, Lugonjo called the Green Infinity Bloom. Uh, I was very much impressed with their, up to now, they are still trying to, to work hard with, with their vegetable growing and, uh, and also to, to co co coherence that has happened after that is, is, is quite notable. So we therefore look forward to the outcome of this food uh, systems dialogue, taking into account the structural challenges, very important, that are faced by uh, to, to boost food production and build resilience to shocks and stress, and how the vulnerable smallholder farmers can be supported to sustainably produce own food and secure access for sale or income. So thank you very much for this with these few remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kimboa. I, I, I particularly must uh, allude to your emphasis on, on how it is important that Uganda's um, development agenda is aligned to the global processes. And you, you mentioned the UNFCC, that's the, for climate change and all other global uh, processes or global agenda that uh, Uganda and the city of Etembe is also uh, part of. It is important that we align all of these and also that um, structural challenges um, in food production must also, must also be tackled. And so it's one of the sense of this, of this um, dialogue today so that we can also look at these together, these challenges and provide solutions to them. Thank you very much, Mr. Richard. Welcome. So we are, we are going forward now, and I, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Samson Semakula to just give us a, a presentation on food governance and flows in Entebbe City. In other words, we want to understand better how uh, food flows all through Entebbe City, where it's, uh, and the relationship between production and consumption, where is the food that is being consumed in Entebbe City, where, where are they coming from? Also, in terms of food governance, how is it done in a Tembe city? Uh, to do this for us and to, to, to contextualize this, we want to invite uh, Mr. Samson Semakula. Mr. Semakula? Mr. Semakula? Um, Are you speak. muted, uh, Samson? Please unmute. Uh, you're you're muted now. Uh, Mr. Samson. Okay, let me see if I can. Hello? Hello. Yes, I can hear you now. Mr. Samson, welcome. Um, I extend my presentation earlier. I don't know whether it can be projected or I should do it from this side. Let me stop sharing and then you can share from your side, please. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Um, you can share from your side now. Can you see me now? 
Yes, but it is uh, you have to um, ensure that it enters the full screen mode. Um, Is that okay now? Um, can you go down and where? I think it's okay now. Okay now. Okay, thank you very much. I move to a slide to a quieter place because I'm in the I'm in the market right now. Okay. Let me find a quieter place now. And uh, I'm going to talk about the opportunities of maximizing the benefits of let grey food security. Um about in which for which the print half of it is under what we under let it area. That serves also to emphasize that uh, how important the lake is to the communities in the that's a map briefly showing the area. So the uh, Mr. Zemakula, um okay, I think we lost him. Um Mr. Semakula. Seems to be back, but he's uh, muted. Yes. Uh, I was wondering because your your line is breaking, Mr. Semakula. If we have yes, your presentation, maybe we can we can I'm share looking. we can share the screen from our side and then you can speak mm -hmm. to it so that we yeah. uh, uh, I was saying that. Mr. Semakula, I was saying that your, your line is breaking. So mm. probably we will share the screen. We will share the screen from our side. We will share your presentation from our side. Yeah. And then you can speak to your presentation. Um, I was wondering, Solofina, would you be able to do that for us? Just share Mr. Semakula's um, Samsung's yes, presentation. Yes, I can, I can do that from my side so that um, then um, you can switch off your video. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, just okay. let me know when to the next. The next yeah, uh, Mr. Samson, uh, maybe you can also um, switch off your video. Sorry? Maybe you can switch off your video so and then try to um, speak louder so that we can hear you in order to yeah. save bandwidth. And then okay. you will tell us to move the slides. You can say next slide, next slide, then we'll be moving it like that. Okay. Great. So please mm -hmm. try and speak louder now. Okay, I'll do that. So, in terms of the peninsula, into the Lake Victoria, and the half of Entebbe is under Lake Victoria. That helps to really emphasize the, the importance of uh, Lake Victoria to, to uh, the people of Entebbe. Next screen, please. Okay. Entebbe is also very, very close to the equator, as you can see from the reading. It's uh, near on the zero. Not really, which is quite uh, near the equator. It's a tropical forest. It's a, it has a tropical rainforest uh, climate, which makes it uh, which makes it uh, which gives it a very good year-round climate. And uh, it's very urban. Most uh, a very big part of it is really not uh, the sophisticated urban setting. It's a mix between the the two. And the population is about 85,000. And the, in about, uh, in about, uh, uh, yeah, in about uh, 17,800 households with a growth rate of about 2.2. And uh, just over half of them being female. Next slide, please. Um, the Lake Victoria fisheries contributes about 3% to the national gross domestic product and about 12% to the agricultural sector domestic product. And in Entebbe, 
five of the 24 villages depend on local projects for their economic livelihood. Almost 100% entirely they depend on the lake. They are fishing or doing something about fish, about the fish for their livelihood. And we have uh, the two major types of the fish caught, which include the Nile perch and the tilapia. And uh, the big bonus with the Nile or the perch is the omega-3, which is the uh, which is very good for body health. And uh, the tilapia is also, also has the same fatty acid. So the, the fish in Lake Victoria is quite healthy to eat. And uh, it has those very good proteins, as you may probably all know. Uh, yes, please, next slide. That is the male tilapia, very delicious. And then it goes to about uh, one and a half kilos. At the, at the big size. Next. No sense. Uh, something semacula. Um, we can't hear you again. Oh, I think we lost him again. Um, I apologies for the disruption, you know, sometimes um, internet connection can be unpredictable sometimes. So I believe Mr. Semakula will join us back uh, soon. Okay. Dennis, what's going on? No sound. So are we proceeding any further? Um, if we are not able, I just want to give it some 30 seconds. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we move to the next presentation and then we allow Mr. Semakula to continue later. Um, Solofina? Um, thank you very much, Daniel. And then I will I'll share a presentation. I'll share a yeah, presentation please. with everyone and uh, and also um, share my screen as well. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Oh, he's back. Hello. Oh, Mr. Samakula. You... Welcome, welcome back. Um, to so something happened to the link. It's no. fine. Can we continue, Solofina, with uh, Mr. Samson? Yeah. Yeah. Let me share my screen just now so that we can continue with his presentation. Okay. So, Mr. Samson, you can continue, please, um, from where you stopped. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, during the maybe the previous slide, okay, that's it. Yes. Yeah, you're okay. Now that is the night lecture. It goes to about can go to about a hundred kilograms each. Not big. Next slide, please. And then it's, it's please, Mr. Samson, please um, speak, project louder, speak louder, please, or move to closer to your computer so that we can hear. Okay. It's, uh, Thank you. It's the main contributor of uh, proteins 
to the community and I try to show the the, the, the food value of the land cut. Uh, as you can see, it can give the person the necessary protein, the daily protein requirement. And then the surplus is always sold to help with the income of the family. Next, next slide, please. Then uh, the lecture has some other benefits, like uh, the source of fresh water, the domestic of the domestic importers. In Uganda, we just uh, we use the fresh water from the laboratory directly. We just filter a little bit, and then it's, it's consumable. So that's a huge benefit. And also, the electric water basin has a good area climate, making it really favorable for food production, for food production. and this is an influence of the lake. And then it also contributes 5% to the local revenue of the municipality in form of Jews and taxes and rents from tourism. And also it has a huge reserve of flora and fauna with various social economic benefits. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, the legislature has some challenges. The, for instance, the declining fish stock which are due to bad fishing methods, uncontrolled fishing, and the lake that we fish all the year round. Nobody asks you to stop or to let the, the, the stocks grow. And also, if you share this source between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, Rwanda, and so the, the regulations differ on all, on, on, on all sides of the, of the lake. And then there was a recent heat wave in the lake, which resulted in the death of the uh, a very big percentage of the the, the, the layer parts because it's very sensitive to temperature changes. Then also the fishing communities have the challenges with the diseases, such as the AIDS, then the normal diarrhea diseases, and also now the COVID-19 they have been affected so much. And also incidentally, most of the fishing communities have poor infrastructure, poor roads, poor network, the competitive market. And also, social services, school, education, health, and things like that. And uh, the people in the fishing areas think they are not benefiting equitably from the fisheries resource because they believe the middlemen and the industrialists are benefiting more than them from the from the lake resource. And also, it is characteristic in the in the fishing communities, there are no schools and hospitals and other essential facilities. And then also the, the activity of fishing is of high risk in the, in, the, in the communities. And they don't have things like insurance or rescue facilities. So those are some of the challenges faced by the fishing communities in the left Victoria and in the Next slide, please. So some of the the bright the bright future issues we can see. We know that the nile patch reproduces rapidly, so the stock recover quite rapidly, and the, it's also competitive in the local and the international market. It's a very competitive fish, and also there are plans by the East African Community Government to regulate fishing activities in the Lake Victoria to boost the stock. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I beg to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Semakula. It has been a, 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 an informative uh, presentation, and you have attempted uh, to contextualize the um, the importance, especially the importance of um, Lake Victoria to um, the food system of Etembe, essentially in terms of um, food production, and how, even how this is contributing to um, livelihoods in Etembe. You said that 25% of, of the villages in, in Etembe depend on Lake Victoria and that um, urban agriculture is also growing now and is also dependent on the water resources of Lake Victoria. So. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I'd like to go over to my colleague, Solofin Anekesa, for our own presentation now on um, 
on the food flows, like try attempting to understand uh, in, in terms of us contextualizing or understanding the processes of food flows of governance also, why this is important and how we can look at issues of, of food systems using these lenses. Um, over to you, Solofina. Um, thank you very much, Daniel, for that. And I would like to thank our speakers as well as uh, our participants in today's dialogue. Um, thank you for joining our conversation. And as ICLI, our role is always to, to empower cities and stakeholders to, to share the right tools, to share the right resources, to be able to support, um, to support both cities and different city stakeholders in performing the roles they play. And because today's dialogue is focusing on, um, on, on the city's food system, uh, so we thought we'd share resources around understanding urban food flows and governance as a whole. Um, to be able to, um, to give different stakeholders involved at different stages of either the value chain, uh, at different stages of, um, of food system governance, or involved in different activities or programs that affect the food system, and in this case that affect um, uh, the Lake Victoria Benson and the Lake Victoria Benson communities in one way or another. So I'm going to present on how we can better understand urban food flows and urban food government. So. At ICLI Africa, as we are uh, looking at food, uh, we've, we've, we, look at through, through, we look at food through different lenses. And more especially because of the complexities around urban food, um, that is why it's important to have these multiple lenses in which to view food. And I think importantly, um, one thing that we, can't, um, that we can't avoid is first of all looking at the, uh, at the food value chain. And food value chain um, sort of, happens along different stages and it can start from uh, it can start from production the production of food and whether this or not happens in cities um, it, it's something that is up for discussion but we know that cities have access to food whether it's produced within the city or within the city's food region and then from here um, we either move to transportation and aggregation of food uh, we move to processing of food we need we move to markets and distribution consumption as well as resource and waste discovery. And it's particularly important to understand how food moves through the city uh, because, um, because understanding the city supply chain uh, provides really some of the material pers perspectives and tells us where to intervene in the food system. For example, if Entebbe's role is much stronger in production, in much stronger in transportation and aggregation, or it is stronger in markets and distribution, or it could be in consumption, or even in food processing, um, as some of our presenters have noted that there's a lot of fish processing activity that is happening within the city. Then how can the city be able to, um, be able to, to manage this to, uh, and have um, sort of multiple benefits across other activities of the food chain? What is critical, for example, for Entebbe City? Or where does Entebbe City have such a key role uh, that can influence other, other elements of the food value chain? Uh, so whereby if you are investing in, for example, production, in transportation, in processing, um, what are those um, effects that can have, what are those multiple effects that can, that can happen throughout the entire food value chain? So that's why understanding food is important because it helps you to understand what is critical, what is important for a city, and how this can be used um, to have multiple impact and multiple um, advantages um, developed across other areas of the food value chain. And then, of course, what is important is always understanding what food security, food security entails. Uh, food security entails, first of all, the availability of food. You know that uh, sufficient amounts of nutritious, of nutritious food are being produced. And then that communities have access to this food. And what does access here mean? Access in terms of um, they have physical access to the nutritious food, but then also um, through, um, through factors like income can with the income that people are earning, can they access nutritious food? And then in terms of utilization, uh, what kind of food is being accessed? Is it nutritious food or is it a food that is not healthy for the population? And of course, if populations are not accessing nutritious food, that's where we have issues of uh, malnutrition happening in communities. And I think one problem that is particularly specific for cities are issues to do with obesity. Um, but then also you have issues to do with malnutrition or undernutrition happening. And this comes to issues around malnutrition and not being able to access um, nutritious food within cities. And then, of course, stability is important because um, to be able to achieve food security, 
uh, food has to be available, it has to be accessed, and it has to be utilized um, if efficiently by the bodies or by the, by the different consumers of the food. So stability is important because it lets us understand the state of food security. And of course, a, an area cannot say it's food security if any of these factors are not um, well balanced out. So if um, food supply is not enough, that affects food access, and then it eventually affects uh, utilization of the food. Um, and I think importantly, when we are looking at food systems, are the issues around agency. Agency here speaks to different stakeholders, um, right from local government officials uh, to all these different stakeholders along the food value chain. Transporters, informal traders in markets, or uh, formal traders uh, that, are, that are set up either in the market or in, uh, in, in large uh, supply chain stores. Um, so all of these have important roles to play and, um, and their role in the food system should be able to be re recognized, but then also supported at different levels. And what we've encountered is that sometimes um, they support for formal actors in the food system and informal actors are excluded. So how can a support be extended to especially the informal actors as well as other, other vulnerable actors uh, along the food value chain? And then sustainability is extremely important. And that is um, one, some of the discussions that we want to have today, issues around environmental sustainability in the food value chain um, and how this can support um, continuous production and availability of food. But then also how environmental sustainability uh, is key for issues related to climate resilience um, and promoting uh, continuous supply of food now, but then also in the future. Um, so importantly, I think what we'd want to, to, to look at is understanding the different entry points uh, for looking at urban food policy and governance. So an integrated urban food policy and governance approach implies the involvement and equity of diverse stakeholders and across different actors. So it looks at food system um, action that should be taken uh, in each sector for a systematic approach to be effective. And here, what are these different sectors? What are these different uh, stakeholders that can influence um, food policy and food policy governance? So we're looking at a sector such as urban planning. Uh, we know that um, historically food has been planned to be outside of the city. But now with the pressure of having to feed more and more urban residences with a growing urban population, uh, we need to think of better ways of how to integrate food into the city. And urban planning is quite a, a key tool to, to promote this. Then we are looking at issues of food access, as I've talked about in, um, in the presentation around uh, food security. Public health is, essential, is very essential to, um, to food policy and governance, or it's a very essential component of the food system issues around climate change and environmental degradation because um, resources come directly from the environment to support um, food growth, to support the movement of food. So once the environment is degraded, then this directly affects um, access to food. It affects production of food and affects stability of food um, within the food system. And then importantly, looking at food waste and resource recovery. You know, instead of looking at food, the food value chain as a linear, as a linear chain, um, we have to start thinking about it as a circular chain. Um, one where there's uh, limited food loss, but then also there's recovery of resources with initiatives, for example, such as waste to energy, um, reusing, reusing waste food into, um, as fertilizers, among other initiatives. And we cannot ignore the importance of the local economy, and which directly affects people's incomes in one way or another. If people cannot access, um, do not have access to adequate incomes, this directly af affects uh, the ability to access nutritious food. And then, of course, looking at food safety across different um, elements of the food value chain, food safety in production, um, using the right uh, agricultural inputs, food safety in, uh, during food transportation, food safety during uh, food production, and then food safety during food retail, as well as consumption. And then, of course, looking at issues of availability that we've discussed uh, when looking at, uh, at food security. So let's take a step back and look at how um, food can be at the center of nature, climate, and equity. So different food systems and different food system actors in Africa need to, need to really center food uh, because, first of all, and this can be done through, first of all, regenerative nature, regenerate nature, and then conserve natural resources. Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that the agriculture sector, but then also other elements of the food value chain are directly uh, dependent on, uh, on natural resources. 
such as land, water, and air. So these are critical to the food system. So therefore, as we are thinking about creating a sustainable food system, we should be able to also think about how best to protect the resources that ensure that we have continuous supply to food. Um, and here, this conversation is especially important to the Lake Victoria Benson, because it does not only feed Entebbe, but Lake Victoria Benson uh, is able to, um, to feed uh, the entire Uganda, but then also other countries that are along um, that are along the shores of the lake. And then it's always important to connect citizens. And this can be through urban community food gardens as well as other open spaces. And I know that in Uganda, the culture of growing food in homes is quite strong. So then how can we enhance this? How can, how can citizens be able to, um, to better grow and access uh, spaces to grow their own food? And then of course, uh, we have to consider how best we can mitigate climate crisis. The growth of food uh, does emit um, greenhouse gas gases. The transportation of food does emit greenhouse gases. The processing of food does emit greenhouse gases. So then how can we ensure that we are meeting, we are meeting our requirements to ensure access to food uh, without degrading the environment? So here is looking at issues around uh, sustainable energy, Look, looking at issues around increasing efficiencies across the food value chain to be able to mitigate um, greenhouse gas emissions that eventually um, uh, lead to the climate crisis. And then important is to look at issues around ending injustice. Um, for example, increasing access to food to the most vulnerable. And this can be done, for example, through school feeding programs or through uh, initiatives um, set up by either civil society organizations in part partnership with the city to be able to ensure access to nutritious food. And I think food, Food in our, in our cultures is really about celebration. And we should be able to advocate for the importance of our local food, uh, for the importance of initiatives such as breastfeeding, and then um, continuing our local food, our local food, and then growing it, um, being able to add nutrients to it so that we continue the growth of our local food because local food is, um, is indignant or is a certain locality and therefore, uh, there are less chances associated with um, with it being uh, with it being degenerative to the environment, and then of course finding ways of improving economic participation uh, by supporting, uh, for example, youth and women-led agribusinesses and different organisations, and then also uh, opening up our spaces to be able to uh, to support better informal traders that are dealing in food. Uh, we find that most of the access, most of the food needs within certain cities are met by, by informal food traders. But then when it comes to regulation, we do not give them the adequate support to be able to, um, to, be able to support, to be able to provide us with the nutritious food in clean environments. And then also to, to provide them with uh, accessible financial resources that can enable them to grow their businesses and then um, increase the access to food within the cities. So that is uh, my presentation, and I hope uh, we can take out some of the key issues to guide our discussions later on in the breakout rooms. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, um, Solofina, for that um, interesting contextualization. And I particularly like um, what you said about the food system, about um, collaboration and about um, coordination of the food system. You say that food system action must consider each sector and actors for the, for the systemic approach to it to be effective. And so you've emphasized multi-sectoral um, coordination in terms of each sector within the um, government um, working together to improve the food system, public health, waste, um, economy, um, urban planning, they must work together to move the food system forward because essentially they have linkages with the food system. And also that uh, the food system that we must advocate for must be one that is just and equitable. It must involve everyone and there must be collaboration. We must work together. And that's also a sense of what we are doing today to give voices to people and say, yes, this is what we want for our food system. This is, not what, this is what is not working. And this is what we want to work so that we can move forward. Thank you very much, Solofina, for that. And um, I think we, we are moving ahead now, and we are going to listen to another presentation now, uh, just basically contextualizing um, Tembe City's food system and the relations it has with Uganda generally. 
we have here Mercy Sebuliba, who is, who is going to talk to us about linkages between the Lake Victoria ecosystem and food security in Etembe and Uganda. Mercy, are you with us? Hi, Messi. If you are speaking, oh. maybe. Oh, God. Messi. Good morning, Messi. I think, Messi, if you're speaking, you're still muted and we can't hear you. Okay, now can someone hear me? Yes, um, I heard that. Can you continue? Speaking? Okay, thank you so much. And um, good morning. Uh, let me try to share my screen. I hope you are able to see the screen. Um, it's coming on. Uh, okay. Can you do the full full screen mode? Can you enlarge it? Yeah, it's in full screen mode now. Okay. Um, once again, I want to thank um Ikli and the Municipal Council. Um, Food System Dialogue Summit, um, Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development, and all other partners, plus the facilitators and um, the participants for attending this meeting. My name is Mercy, and I'm the Programs Officer for the Victoria Regional Authorities Corporation. I want to again appreciate the previous speakers. It's like we had shared notes. But um, before I start my presentation, let me make this statement. And I want to say that um, food security in the Lake Victoria Basin is grossly affected by the decisions to prioritize economic growth over sustainable utilization of Lake Victoria ecosystem resources at the local level, national and regional level. Now, um, I'll go straight to my presentation. I'll first of all introduce LAVRA, which is a network of local authorities in the Lake Victoria Benson, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, with prospective membership from Rwanda. And um, we have municipalities, counties, municip um, districts, divisions, and town councils. And that's LAVRA, who strive to work with communities to ensure sustainable utilization of Lake Victoria Benson resources. Um, we understand that Lake Victoria Benson was gazetted as East Africa's economic growth zone. And with that comes urbanization. We have over 40 million people with a growth rate of 5.3.5%. Um, Last year, we had three municipalities and being um, promoted to cities. Now, that means that it is attracting a lot of people from all, all over the country and all over the region. And um, good enough, the Benson has good equatorial climate like um, we've been explained before by the previous speakers. We have the fresh waters. And to me, I see that Lake Victoria Benson has the potential to be the food basket of East Africa. And they can also say Eastern, I mean Eastern Central Africa. We produce over 1 million tons of fish and we um, support um, a variety of crops as well as animal husbandry. The region, however, is marked by poverty, malnutrition, and hunger, especially in islands. For example, we have places like Rakai district in Uganda, Busoga region. And why is it so such a, a place which has all these fertile lands? The, one of the problem is that the farmland is used to grow commercial crops. Talk about sugarcane. Today in Busoga land, sugarcane is the main crop 
which is replacing food crops. Talk about tea farms, hundreds of acres. Talk about flowers in Entebbe here. And unfortunately, we, they, are, they are using chemical fertilizers, which are not friendly to the ecosystem. So food production is left to subsistence farmers who have poor technology for mass production and also have issues of land fragmentations. Um, in Sese, the biggest island in Lake Victoria, it used to be the food supply to Entebbe and other areas around. But today as I'm speaking, the vast land in Sese is filled with palm trees to produce palm oils. We have in this minute cutting of trees for settlement and creation of um, farms. And also we have these indigenous trees being replaced by exotic ones, which are not eco-friendly, both to the soils and to the natural habitat. Um, apparently or coincidentally, this um, issue of COVID has proved the point that some of us have been shouting about. Our natural trees, the fruit trees, for example, the mangoes, um, the mango tree can be both medicinal, you can get timber out of it, you can get um, shade out of it, and even the, it can, you get fruits out of it, vitamin C. And when you look at today, the COVID issue going to the public health that um, Sophia was talking about, Sophia, um, you need, and people who have these, trees, they've really treated COVID and they've succeeded. On the other hand, people who don't have access to these vegetation, they are paying about $1,500 in the hospitals just to get oxygen and in the care um, units, uh, ICUs. So you can see how, how um, I mean, you cannot support that for a week. All your savings will be put and you will um, to the hospital and you will just continue the vicious circle of poverty. Wetland degradation. We are having sand mining, brick mining, subsistence farming, and um, given that um, we are having urbanization, so people are looking out for cheaper ways of settling in the urban areas, but then they're destroying the ecosystem. And the recent water level rise because of the sand mining, and um, environmental degradation, they have seen a lot of property destruction, including food crops, which are grown in the buffer zones. Well, we are talking about food production. Entebbe municipality is a grow, fast growing um, hospitality industry area. However, one of the problem I have is that people are, um, developing that um, horizontally rather than vertically. You know, when you construct houses vertically, you have space to do some backyard gardening and that will limit the amount of money you spend on food. And remember, if you don't eat well, then medicine becomes your food. But food is medicine. So at the end of the day, you end up spending more than what you're supposed to spend. And here comes our friends, the agriculture companies, which are exploiting the local people, the peasant farmers, by selling them what they call improved seeds, which you sell, which you plant only once, you cannot replant it again. And this seed requires you to buy chemical fertilizers to put in. At the end of the day, you cannot reproduce. You have to go again and buy and plant when you have this, you go again and buy. So what will happen when people cannot afford um, buying the seeds? It means that they will have to create um, seeds for the low income earners. And this is affecting our nutrition. That's why we are experiencing a lot of malnutrition. COVID-19, we get food from Western Uganda, mostly Matoke, Irish potatoes, but now with the travel restrictions, what is happening? That means that also our feeding will be affected. Yet that food can be um, produced here. Unfortunately, we have a lot of political interference and impunity on wetland um, 
encroachers. And at times, we get a lot of fights between the um, technical people and the politicians, especially when it comes to enforcing laws to do with environment and also um, wetland encroachment. But what are our suggestions? What should we do? Should we keep on crying? No, not at all. Local authorities working with other um, stakeholders need to come up with a budget support for nature-based green improvements for food security and income supplements. There is um, a proposal we are having to the Ministry of Agriculture to um, um, pilot in Entebbe and uh, other Uganda chapter, whereby we have community seed banks for the local indigenous um, seeds. So that people don't, uh, we minimize the exploitation of these agriculture companies. And we are also saying that the municipal waste, um, at least 30% of the municipal waste can be turned into um, fertilizers. So why can't we invest in such projects instead of um, getting these chemical fertilizers which are not eco-friendly? And also we're talking about conservation of indigenous, indigenous food dishes and animal varieties that are slowly being wiped away. When now that is at the local level, now when we go to the national also local level, the main culprits here are the youths. And, but we have, um, platforms where we can involve the religious leaders, cultural institutions. I mean, a lot of multi-stakeholder engagement in the protection and restoration and regeneration of wetlands, forests, ecosystem um, um, as a whole. For example, we can create buffer zones by planting bamboos. I loved it so much when I was traveling to Rwanda, River Amkagera has buffer is buffered on both sides and um, it's a long street. So we can also copy and benchmark um, so that we can have um, uh, also that will help in promoting biodiversity conservation and also ecotourism. Um, number three, at the regional level, I'm glad that um, LAVRAP working hand in hand with the municipality and other stakeholders who are also here, we are we are heading the formation of um, the Lake Victoria Lead Partners Forum. And we want to have in the Lake Victoria Basin to ensure implementation of Lake Victoria shared vision, as well as SDGs, including fisheries and forest systems in the Lake Victoria Basin. We are also looking at partnership to scale up the education and demonstrative effects of nature-based solution for sustainable food production. Um, this, we are looking at working with NGOs and other stakeholders in the fisheries, water and energy. Also having contiguous plans to address the impacts of future multiple crises on small scale fishing communities. That is engaging, again, um, food security resilience committees in not only in the municipality, but also other local authorities to mobilize rapid response and um, resource mobilization among others. Number six, we are looking at um, creating a targeted support, including food for vulnerable groups like the poor, as well as health, uh, which, um, which are affected by health and um, the diseases, for example, HIV, talk about public health in general, and also having an early warning system. Here we look at um, working with the meteorological information to popular messages um, and sharing different groups like farmers. And this, we are looking at having it done in our local context so that it can be customized, understood, and then implemented. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, that was um, a brief from Lavrock. And once again, we thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mercy, for that uh, presentation.
which is really informative. And um, I think it is a sense of, um, before, I, before, I, before I proceed, um, if you have any question for any of our presenters, you can just drop it on the, in the chat box and I'm going to uh, pick it up and, and ask them. Also, if you also have any uh, contribution, you can also make use of the chat box. Or maybe when we get into the different discussion rooms, you can make your uh, voices heard. Um, and so, uh, Mercy, I was, I was basically just alluding, making reference to your presentation and uh, you emphasized that I, I think it is also the sense of uh, today's dialogue in that how can we tap into the potential of, of Lake Victoria to be a food production orb uh, and, and meet the need, the food needs of not only a Tempe city, but Uganda and even East Africa as a whole. I, I believe that uh, Lake Victoria has that potential and we must do everything within our power to, to ensure that um, it leads us to that. You also um, made mention of um, biodiversity conservation and the importance of um, restoring, regenerating and protecting our wetlands. I think we need to also focus on that and um, make emphasis or lay emphasis on, on the need for nature-based solutions to many of the challenges that um, Lake Victoria is, is, content, is contending with. Um, I think um, it is now time for us. Uh, let me check if we have any question in the chat box for any of our presenters. I can't find any yet, uh, but please feel free to post and I'll pick it up and ask them. You may post now and or later. I know it, it's time for us to, to um, go into our different, um, uh, please, uh, Messi, if you may uh, just, and the uh, screen sharing. Um, um, so yeah, it is, it is, this is the, way, the favorite part that I like in, in, in dialogues, the time for our participants to also contribute towards the discourse, to make their voices heard, and, and to also prefer solutions or highlight issues and prefer solutions to some of these issues. So we are going to go into the session of um, breakouts. And uh, I want to call on uh, Solofina to, um, to explain to us how this process is going to play out in terms of um, yeah how we are breaking out. Solofina. Thank you very much, Daniel. And first of all, I'd like to thank our presenters for contextualizing, uh, for contextualizing the entire food system, because this is going to guide our dialogue. Some of the issues that have been mentioned um, are going to help us reflect upon um, the different questions that have been posed uh, during the uh, in the dialogue. And these questions, um, because we all come from different areas, um, along working in different areas around food. So I think Daniel, if you can go to the slide that has the question that will be posed. So it would be great to bring your personal experience to the dialogue and um, to be as specific as possible. For example, because there are wide ranging issues that have been mentioned, issues to do with infrastructure, issues to do with, um, um, with making the system more inclusive for different actors. But then how can we be more specific? For example, what road infrastructure could be key to opening up, uh, for example, Entebbe to, um, to the rest of the country in terms of supplying and access to food. And this, could this be um, a lake route that is essential to, to, to ease transportation of food? So we should be as specific and should be guided by our work areas in the different work teams that we're coming from. And you'll see that, um, for example, the question that talks about some of the structural challenges, um, that are affecting the food system. You know, this is going to be answered by all of us because we believed that um, all of us in our different work areas, we are experiencing different setbacks and challenges in the, in, across the food system. And then the other questions will be now um, asking us to look at what solutions are, we do, are, are there, what opportunities, what initiatives, what program um, could sort of guide, um, guide the transformation of the food system. And the idea is that once all these are captured, we'll feed into, um, first of all, the national dialogue process, but then also the global dialogue process, so that uh, some of these key issues coming up from different cities, from different localities, 
can be identified and captured so that as we are moving forward uh, from the dialogue, and uh, then uh, different stakeholders are able to understand what are the specific needs affecting different localities, what are the specific opportunities that exist in a certain food system, and who are the key players driving this. So I would like to ask us to be uh, specific, but then to also participate, because that is the only way that we can get input. So Sne, are you ready to break out the rooms? And please um, introduce yourself, get to know each other in the, in the rooms, and then uh, we can kick off the discussion. So each room will be facilitated. Um, to bring out the, the conversations, and then um, I think it's all in your hands now. Over to you, Sne. Are we ready to break out? All right, I think we're all back. Um, so thank you very much for participating in the discussions. I think for our group, Daniel and, and, and our colleagues, we did have uh, such insightful discussions. Thank you for the contributions. So there's a lot coming in, and, and, and I'm a bit worried for the people that are going to do the reporting. How are you going to um, to capture all the rich uh, outputs uh, from from everyone, but thank you very much um, for the contributions. So we are going to have a reporting back uh, to plenary. To uh, so this will be done in in just five minutes or under uh, for the different uh, session facilitators to let us know what are some of the key things coming out of the discussions. Um, what are um, what are the different stakeholders uh, sort of bringing up with regard to the questions that we are being discussed? Uh, I'll hand over to Group One, a representative from Group One or a facilitator from Group One to share with us some of the outcomes. So, thank you very much, uh, Solofina. Now, from our group, uh, uh, on regarding question one, on the strategic structural challenges. Uh, some of the, the points that came out were the issue of purpose and goal that is leading the conversation of land into structural development, leaving little land for agriculture. And then uh, another issue was uh, the, the how to make agriculture more intensive so that the small spaces that are remaining can be used uh, in a more productive way. Then there is another challenge which is to do with political structure, which is not very conducive, uh, especially in regarding to uh, when organization and state actors want to work with uh, state actors to address the challenges that are happening. The issue of flower farming came up and other uh, developments that are contributing to the uh, pollution of the lake. Then lastly, the issue of cage farming, which uh, uh, participants felt need to be studied more, decide where, what is the best carrying capacity and also to avoid uh, maybe some unforeseen uh, uh, negative impacts that may happen uh, in the future, because this is a bit new in Uganda. Uh, then uh, uh, regarding uh, question two, which is to do with policies, programs, and incentives that can be adopted, there was an observation that uh, 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 what we, we, we really need now uh, is not, to, not much to do with policy change or whatever, but to focus more on opposition of existing policies. Uh, that is one key observation that was made that in Uganda, uh, we have a lot of policies, but implementation is really oh, usually a problem. Uh, then it was noted that government's moving away from uh, sector wide planning to more program wide planning. So uh, this is an observation that. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, may, uh, it may require us to, to see how, how, how do we fit in the program-wide planning because government is moving out from sector-wide planning. Then uh, another uh, uh, observation was made that uh, uh, well, we need to see how Entebbe becomes a regional hub for, for transport and receiving goods from other ports along Lake Victoria. Uh, this is more to do with uh, uh, how can uh, the 
strategic location of Entebbe be, uh, be utilized for, for, for to benefit more its people uh, in terms of food security and environmental uh, sustainability. Then another issue was to, to do is exploring collaborative engagements. For example, uh, working towards reducing the problem of plastic waste, whereby, sorry, there is a plank passing down. So whereby uh, different actors can work together to tackle uh, key problems that are facing Lake Victoria, Entebbe, and other cities like uh, plastic waste. Uh, so in brief, that, that's what we managed to come up with uh, in breakout room one. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, David, uh, for for that. I see a hand from uh, from Basil. Please go ahead. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to expound on the point that he made about making Entebbe a transport hub. Mm. Uh, one is that you have Mwanza, Kisumu, and ports, and yet we are depending heavily on movement of uh, goods through the road. Uh, our railway transport has not been well developed. And so by reducing the overload from the Jinja Malaba Busia Highway, we could mm. take advantage of one that the Sumo uh, entry point and then have some uh, hubs that can feed both Port Bell, Kampala, uh, Masaka, and even connect down to Rwanda, DRC Congo, and Burundi. You mm. reduce the journey that you have to move on road. If you have water transport from Kisumu to a port that is connecting you to Masaka, for example. Absolutely. Uh, so, so Entebbe would actually serve as a good hub for three ports where they can, that can fit the DRC Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting point you raised because also Entebbe is where the national airport is. So there's that yeah. almost strategic advantage that Entebbe has that is not being explored. You know, it has access to the lake, there's uh, access to the airport. And then also, if this is also reinforced with the, if this is reinforced with the railways, then it makes um, access to, to other regional hubs so much easier, other than always taking the longer routes um, to get to, for example, the neighboring countries, but then also other, other, other regional um, hubs um, along the lake. So I think that's that's quite a critical point, and it's one that requires that the city works in partnership, for example, with national government and um, the national planning bodies around uh, transport. So I think this is these are some of the areas we see how it's important for cities to collaborate um, or to 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 be able to plan better with the um, with the national and national and regional bodies. So thank you very much for that contribution. Um, I would like to hand this over to Group Two. Okay, um, you can hear me very well. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, this is uh, a group two. We had uh, five people. Uh, we had a food rights activist by the name of Agnes Kirabo, and then uh, urban planners, uh, you know, Habitat and others. Now, what are the structure challenges affecting Entebbe's food system? That was the first question. We noted that. Uh, we went back as well as the colonial area, the colonial time, that the traditional narrative about Entebbe still stands. We believe that Entebbe expensive place as far as food is concerned, as far as the colonial times. So uh, it's still like the city is organized for visitors or tourists. So it means if the, if the prices have to go up, the mindset in that sense. And then Entebbe being a first urban place, by the way, even uh, before Kampala, the urban mind still remains and uh, the, the, the food requirements and the standards set by the colonial setting or the colonial progress remain. And therefore there's less interaction between the food market and the rural, the, the rural pro production areas. So what we have is uh, we have a rural, rural poor on one side and then the urban getting food from different sources. So it creates a, a, you know, a price on its own. And then the food environment, uh, uh, we noted that uh, the food acquisition, um, in terms of the the, the policies, 
um, and the practices for the fast growing urban settings are not really in place. The, the population is growing very fast as noted, but the policies are not are missing. And then Entebbe is unique in the sense that it's part of what is so, you know, very hot cake in terms of food land acquisition. So it is moving towards more rural areas are moving towards urban areas. So you have a 50 by 100, for example, feet uh, residential plot, which is very expensive. So at the end of the day, the poor, poor are, are evicted because that would be their arable land and it becomes a residential. And then even the lake shores or are also grabbed to say the least. And therefore that makes Entebbe expensive. For example, someone noted that it's very expensive to eat fish in Entebbe. Then the other thing is waste management and pollution, all these things, not on, not on the side from Entebbe, but also from the, from the hinterland. So, so if, if you want to say the fast growing urban settings uh, that are you know, neighboring Entebbe, uh, and then the palm oil growing, and then the water for drinking, it also becomes affected, and therefore the, even the fish, the fish safety is then becomes questionable. So the other things were related to the the urban sprawl that affects wetlands and forests, and then the urban markets. We noted that one one one, one uh, striking one was that fresh foods, and uh, and especially the ready food or cooked food, is an anything in these cities, including Kampala and Entebbe. But uh, less attention is given to this. No one, no one has an idea about how many people are eating cooked food in the evening as far as early as 3 p.m. up to late in the evening. But, but there's a huge dependence, the population dependence on this food. And therefore, it needs to be looked at. Then uh, on the question two, who are the key uh, food systems transformation stakeholders? We are sort of synthesizing it from, from the above discussion. And they've noted that uh, First of all, the policy plan, policy makers and planners, for example, in Entebbe, they need to, to, to appreciate that food, the, 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 food the, the above issues of food, the urban food policy in Entebbe is very important because they have to look at the, both the rural poor, both the poor and the rich, and also the food safety policies and other practices so that the food that is, for example, that is cooked, that is brought into the city or the, or the municipality, is also, you know, it's sort of guided, guided uh, standards and so on. And then someone mentioned the territorial government, some of those stakeholder forums to be uh, put up because they are, as, as you saw, as you, you yourself, you, you had this from the presentations, there are a whole range of stakeholders around the food value chain. So we need to discuss food governance and call them food, food councils in, in the urban and rural continent so that we know where does it come from, where, how does it go, where does it get hanged, and so on. And then the public health angle. Public health stakeholders were brought in because safety, safe food, especially cooked food in the evening markets needs to be taken up seriously with the designated places and, and licensed because this is very urgent because people are depending on it. And then for the local authorities, the must, food must be made available, accessible and affordable because a big percentage of are poor people and the, everyone deserves to eat food safe, safely given the food environment in Entebbe and other cities. And then also informing planning and food systems transformation. We ask ourselves many questions around this. Who, who are the majority and where do they source their food in Entebbe? So who are the majority of people in Entebbe? Where do they get their food? Who produces it, transports it? Uh, vend it to consumers. Policy, uh, so there was a, also realized that there were politics around markets, which is unwritten and written. Uh, which food gets into the market, uh, and, and so on. There are some sort of written and unknown rules which need to be uncovered. And lastly, on the national level actions, we, we, we appreciated that there is very important to have national level actors, uh, maybe the ministries and so on. But we realized that it's very important that the rules, like clean, free, clean foods start from below, meaning that a municipality like Entebbe, uh, you know, stands a chance to have things that work rather than allowing it to be, to be from up to bottom. Um, briefly, that is what we, we, we shared during this, uh, our discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard, for, for sharing. And then maybe I can pose the question to your group as well, um, and maybe to you that, is there no longer a case for cooperative societies? Um, as key stakeholders? 
um, if I start, maybe someone else can add, but I think the, the, the importance of cooperative societies is, is, is for me, it, it comes closer to what we, we, we mentioned about uh, understanding the, 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 the food transformation, I mean, the, the, the whole food chain, because if we knew, for example, that who buys the food and how, how the poor, uh, both, the, both as consumers and producers, then it might be that a solution could be come from how, how do we work together so that the food is brought into in, in a more orderly way, but also safely, but also the, 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 the poor benefit more than it is at the moment. So in short, I think cooperatives definitely becomes very handy. And someone who else can add so from that. Uh, Richard, thank you. This is Peter from Recolto. Uh, you have said it early because we need to trace uh, from yeah. the market where the, the, the supply is coming from. Mm. And uh, we work with cooperatives and we know the benefits of working with cooperatives because you can, you can train them well. But the first thing is to get the statistics well in mm. Entebbe and uh, know where the supply is coming, is originating from because you work backwards and know yes. what the vendor, the consumer wants in, because all farmers uh, believe one language, that is price. But you need to work backwards, what the consumer wants. If it is safe food, you're talking about food safety, then you need to work it backwards to see how you can organize the suppliers so that they can able benefit in this, uh, in this, in this uh, business model that you're going to come up with. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think Mr. Azari had also raised your hand. Uh, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, one, uh, we also need to understand how cooperatives are formed in Uganda. Mm. Uh, because the, the current cooperatives are triggered basically by money. They are not entirely organic, like the old cooperatives we used to have that were triggered by interest of people coming together to pull resources and work together. So that narrative is going to be important in the way you think about setting up or supporting cooperatives. Because whenever you talk about savings and credit cooperatives, the first thing that comes to mind is how much money are you giving us to start? It's no longer the other thing of how much money do we have to start? So that narrative is critical in the cooperative formation. But I think also the value chain, the food value chain is an important thing to understand. Uh, I think people have already talked about it. the flow of how does food get into Entebbe? Where is it produced? In our group, we discussed about the need for intensive farming around urban centers after having recognized that, uh, uh, for example, Kampala is fed by 70% of the food coming from the neighboring districts. So, and part of the food is being produced from those small plots. Can we make it more, more efficient uh, through intensive uh, food production? And so it is, we still have an individualistic mindset in doing business. The COP arrangement comes in only when the businessman thinks that there is something to benefit. So that narrative is important to bring out. Uh, and that's my contribution in that regard. No, thank you very much for that. Um, and we've had such great discussion. Uh, there's been a contribution uh, from Henry in the chat. Uh, something to do with climate change resilience. We need to build capacity of people in alternative energy technologies. Uh, issues to do with uh, cooking stove, construction, briquette making, uh, fireless baskets, equipping stakeholders with the competencies in zero waste management from grassroots, um, and then runoff water harvesting, um, as well as others. So please look in the chat and, and, and comment or contribute towards um, Henry's comment. So thank you very much. So I'll hand over to group three. Uh, Masi, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, group three, question one. Actually, I will start from where Mogisha started and um, ended. We talked, we talked about value chain actors. And um, we said um, there is need for capacity building because some of these people, um, they are exploited by the market people. So we look at, we need to look from the time the food is produced to the time when the food is 
brought to the market. Um, so we need to put um, right structures. Then we also looked at um, the problem challenge number two in Entebbe is um, the way the land is distributed or the way the land is um, occupied in Entebbe. Yes, we talked about having the rich and having the poor and the little access to land. So thought that maybe some, um, if we could have some of the places gazetted for food production, that would be um, something very good. Then they also talked about um, balancing soils, um, textures, and also soil sampling. Um, this came in that um, uh, different soils produce different foods. So you have to know the pH of the soil. Now, uh, some soils may not be able to produce some certain type of food, and that will affect the agriculture and the food security in the area. Now, while discussing this, um, my group was looking at both uh, um, the food generating from the rural community coming to Entebbe and also vice versa. Then um, they also talked about um, uh, being overshadowed by the bigger local authorities. For example, Entebbe, being overshadowed by Wakiso districts to an extent that um, they don't even discuss issues to do with food because it's like they always get orders from above from the bigger local authority and being a municipality and Wakiso being a city. And um, also another structure challenge um, we were talking about, um, we were discussing um, um, issues of um, implementing the greening process of the city, that um, it is somehow sometimes tricky to implement this, this included um, political continuity. Every five years we select, we elect um, political leaders and each political leader comes with um, an agenda. Uh, so, you may have a mayor who is really in for greening and another mayor will come in with a different agenda. So that continuity becomes a problem. Um, also, um, they talked about the cultural perspectives and mindset of the people. Someone was talking about when they were teaching people how to grow food in um, broken um, um, plastic bags. And people were like, no, in our culture, we grow food on a farm, not in those things. So, so those are some of the challenges that we saw. However, the question too was saying, how can the municipal council and local stakeholders be empowered to carry on, extend and identify opportunities to resilient and um, environmentally sustainable urban ecosystems? And um, one of the points was that um, we need intensive capacity building, especially in climate change and um, environmental sustainability, clean energy, um, agroforestry, water harvesting, and also irrigation. And um, also we got uh, that we need to also do extensive research, especially customized to Entebbe municipality as um, a geographical area, so that we give um, uh, so that we can implement um, um, practices which are proved and also um, tried. Then we also need to benchmark with other local authorities what they're doing. Maybe there's something that we can copy and customize in our area. They talked about giving technical support to the communities. Um, also noted um, getting bylaws if they're not in existence and enforcing them to translate into action and also putting these bylaws into a language that people will understand. Uh, they talked about um, having a human-based approach to food production and also resource management. Talked about um, infrastructure, for example, um, the roads, 
also the means by which food is carried. Someone noted um, some fish, especially to, um, the Nile patch is carried on the border border when the tail is almost, actually not almost, it goes on um, rubbing on the road. And that is um, from the public health perspective, that is a public health hazard. So we need to improve on the infrastructure and um, on the storage system. Then um, also talked about alternative source of um, agriculture, um, like um, fish pond farming. Um, yes, sometimes the lake, it is hard to access the lake, but if we can um, invest in two um, alternative sources, that would be another way of improving. And also um, introducing other fish species which can um, acclimatize to the local conditions within the environment. So um, I don't know if there is something that I've left out um, group members. Um, this is what I was able to capture. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Amasi. Uh, we do have some comments also coming in in the chat. Uh, there's uh, an addition from, uh, from Dr. Jibril, and he really raises an important point that yes, uh, cooperative societies used to work better originally uh, from the first producers, but then with the evolving models around um, urban areas or how, how we can approach urban food system, how can, sort of, how can we reinvent our cooperative societies to be able um, to work for, for urban related food system or to coordinate systems both um, from urban areas, right, to or from the rural areas to the urban areas. And, and Masi, when you mentioned issues around the human-based approach to food production, you know, it, 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 it raises a lot of questions. Maybe um, if you could just expound on that slightly, uh, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, because there's also another interesting comment that comes in from Jacob. The challenge is not only access to the land, but access to the lake also. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a very important uh, remark there. You know, there's access to the land, but then also are there a lot of restrictions in place currently with people um, where people are not able to access the, the lake resources. So Masi, if you can maybe use a minute to, to expand on what human-based approach to food production means. Thank you. Um, what I said was a um, right-based approach. Right like based um, approach. food is a human right. Mm. Yes, yes. All right. And, and what would this entail? Sorry? And what would this entail, a right best approach? Yeah, um, if it is um, your human rights to have um, food, then um, mm. it's, um, it goes on to the municipal authorities to ensure that um, they put systems in place that are um, conducive um, for the community to access food. For example, we've been talk talking about infrastructure, we've been mm -hmm. talking about um, storage, and um, also having people access the natural resources. For example, when you go to the lake, Unfortunately, um, last time I was in one of the landing sites and mm. I was being told that some people own plots and they have titles in the buffer zones. Now that beat my understanding. How can you get a plot in a buffer zone? So, mm. Uh, mm. so that means that um, the, these areas cannot be utilized by the community sustainably because someone is owning them, which is wrong. So um, that is one of the ways that um, can have that um, right best approach to the food and also put the, the leadership um, in um, to come up and explain clearly and also be clear on where, where should people stop when accessing properties. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely, um, thank you very much for that. I would like to hand this over to group four now. Over to you, Lauren. Is it Lauren or Daniel? Daniel. Daniel, over to you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we had a very engaging session. 
And um, in response to the first question that says that what are the structural challenges affecting a ten-based food system, um, we talked about infrastructure uh, that there, are, there is uh, deficient infrastructure, and this infrastructure relates to transport infrastructure uh, such that um, food producers are not able to transport their produce to places of um, consumption or where they are going to be sold. Um, also relating to infrastructure is um, market infrastructure. Uh, we've got issue of deficient market infrastructure. That's why markets are under the management of um, local authorities. Um, the human resources to manage them, to manage these markets are not always there. They're not always available by, uh, they are not always put in place by the local government. And so this must be looked into. I think also what is resonating, one of some of the things we have been hearing is the issue of um, land ownership and the um, land use system. And what we discussed in my group was the fact that the people who own land are uh, essentially, they are not necessarily uh, contributors to the food system as active actors as it were. So we've got uh, absentee landlords and those who pro and, and essentially those who produce food are tenants or squatters. So they don't have access to land. And this also leads to a problem of um, encroachment to lands that um, protected lands or protected wetlands. So if people are not able to access land, uh, they, some of them will eventually tend to uh, put laws into their own lands and, and encroach vacant land that, that are accessible to them. So that is playing out in, in, in Itembe. And also we talked about, uh, we discussed around deforestation. And uh, we highlighted the fact that this is a precursor to escalating and climate uh, change impact. And also deforestation also contributes to soil erosion and flooding. And the fact that Lake um, Victoria Basin is susceptible to flint is already susceptible to flooding. So the more we, uh, this deforestation is practiced, the more it is escalated. And so uh, we must look into that. One major issue that, that resonated uh, a lot in our discussion was the fact that, yes, there are many policies that are available, but implementation has been a challenge. Um, so policies relating to the food system or to food production or to even infrastructure, and uh, that these are available, but um, implementation it has been a challenge. And two major key issues that are affecting implementation is the issue of number one, poverty, uh, which is preventing effective implementation of policies. I think I, I alluded to um, land encroachment and all of that. So if you don't have resources to buy your own land, you tend to basically want to encroach protected lands. And so much more when you see that the protected lands, uh, people that are supposed to enforce it, we don't have the resources to basically want hire inspectors and people that are supposed to be monitoring uh, land encroachment, then uh, people will just encroach this land. So poverty is, 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 is a factor. And a major factor affecting implementation that we also alluded to was um, finances, funding. Uh, funding is not necessarily available to facilitate even the appointment of, um, of, um, of land um, managers or appointment of food system um, actors or yes in the go at the government level so you cannot appoint them you cannot employ them that to manage markets and to manage land resources so we must look into ways we can essentially finance um, policies uh, that's uh, finance implementation of policies um, in terms of the second question initiatives and good practices that have happened presently or that could happen uh, to facilitate uh, food security and environmental sustainability. Um, we alluded to the fact that uh, consumers now should begin to demand for food quality and food safety, that food safety standards, that consumer also has a role to play. And I think what we came, what we agreed upon in our group was that there should be collaboration between CSOs, between the media, between consumers, and even the government to ensure food safety uh, standards are there to by everyone. And um, we must also adopt farming system that promotes agroecology, environmental sustainability and resilience. And um, there is mention that uh, 
that um, biotechnology and G the GMO law must be passed by the government and the municipality and the country needs to needs to champion that and that we must utilize markets uh, to 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 for for fish farming and also that we apart from depending on Lake Victoria we must also now begin to teach people about how to do fish farming so that uh, they don't necessarily depend on Lake Victoria but they can begin also to do fish farming in their um, areas so that they, they don't depend on. I think these are some of the things that came out. Finally, I think I should allude to advocacy and consumer awareness that this cannot be overemphasized, that we must sensitize our people about, about food safety standards. We must let uh, um, food producers know uh, about even opportunities by sensitizing them and, and doing awareness campaigns. I think these are some of the things that came out from my group. Over to you, Solofina. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for, for the contribution. Do we have any other comments or questions uh, about Daniel's points? I can see there, there are more comments coming in in the chat, uh, more resources being shared. So please take a look and, and see what contributions are coming in uh, through there. There's something about urban planning and greening the city should change the narratives. So by greening the city using food crops, which in, include fruit trees rather than ornaments on that's a contribution uh, from, from John. So thank you very much, Daniel, for that. Um, and, and what is ringing through across the different groups is the issue of land, uh, land in Entebbe. So it's a, it, 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 it could be quite a contentious issue, access to land and then access to the lake as well. So that's something that is really strongly coming through uh, across all the different discussions. So we'll um, pass this on to Lorraine. Over to you, Lorraine, for the group five outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Ola. Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of overlap between um, the discussions in different groups. Um, group five, um, sort of very overlapping discussion between the challenges and um, opportunities. So I'll just go through the points here um, in no particular order. So limited and adequate funding um and policy architecture is not available um in a lot of cases so some suggestions around making things more accessible making sure that there's credit and finance for urban farmers um across all levels of the food value chain um so there the, the was a note that there is some sort of funding available but it, it's limited to um on the farmer level specifically there was a point raised around that um and then uh, we were talking about uh, there being um, issues with COVID around um, transport limiting uh, food being delivered into Entebbe um, and like interruptions in supply chain, um, especially because the food is coming from outside Entebbe and not uh, closer. So issues of how do we manage um, a more sustainable system or create a more sustainable system uh, when we have to deal with in particular issues around um, pandemics like this, but also just in general. Uh, uh, there was some comments around post uh, harvest food handling and mishandling of food um, reaching the markets or mishandling at markets and contamination of food. And um, sometimes these are then reduced in price and that's more accessible for certain people, but then you're affecting people's health um, and the issues around that. Uh, there was a point noted about planning for food and agriculture at a district and municipal level um, is not as clear and as intentional as maybe it should be. Um, so a point that with Entebbe becoming a city in the next uh, year or so, um, there are lots of plans for like infrastructure and roads and these sort of things, but not a lot of consideration around food and agriculture and how that's going to be incorporated in the kind of growing of Entebbe and the establishment of it being a city. Um, there was a point about uh, tree belts that was suggested in the planning and how these tree belts could be used as an opportunity to boost food systems by, you know, looking at trees that provide food for within the city as one suggestion. Um, and then um, it was noted 
quite interestingly that, and this is related to the land issue that historically, like pre-colonial times kind of thing, um, food was not allowed to be grown in the city. Um, so none of that, none of those existing systems have been around haven't been around for very long um, and with the limited land it is more kind of seen as valuable for things like infrastructure and housing and, and those sort of things so um, again linked to planning how do we deal with um, making space for food and agriculture that's more localized within and, and closer to the city um, because uh, also noting that the food is imported um, from neighboring areas and then some of the more um, opportunities that we were discussing was or, or like ways to uh, achieve these things um, is promoting and advancing kind of farming to, for urban dwellers to lead to more sustainability um, so the implementation uh, of existing policies so that was quite interesting that you know there was a note that Entebbe has these um, ideas around how to manage food sustainably um, but the, there's a need for like a robust plan to roll out these policies and to kind of reach the communities um, and you know the, the city at large uh, in achieving these sustainable food goals. Um, there was a, an interesting point on um, food banks and establishing um, food banks, uh, especially in times of like COVID, um, that they apparently are a number of agencies who are willing to set up food banks but there are no policies around how that if that can happen how that happens and kind of coordination of that um mj can you mute yourself thank you um uh and then there were some interesting points around um the new market and um even that, even though there is a new market, there's still a food waste problem. And then the the good things around the value added section of processing some of that food and the increased storage facilities, but counter to that the point around the connection to energy and food, um, where things like better practices and subsidies and to address reliability. Uh, Priscilla, can you mute yourself? Thanks. Um, uh, need to be addressed uh, around energy. Um, and the cost of energy. Um, and then there was a point on land grabbing and becoming more of an issue and a need to manage or control in inverted commas and, and um, kind of protect land that, that is owned and, and where, where available, make land available for food. Um, yeah, I think those are... The, oh, there, there was one point about, especially during COVID, finding a way to have more inclusive and flexible planning that allows for informal and sort of street food vendors um, to continue to operate even under COVID um, kind of restrictions or, or, or more easily operate because that is a food source for a lot of people and an accessible, affordable food source that sometimes gets kind of left out of the planning process so both in like a COVID space and in kind of future planning even if we create this kind of formal market structure these all informal street and food vendors need to have space within the city to be able to cater for those people that they do cater that they do currently cater for so not removing that from um this the yeah the the planning process that was all the points from our group. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. And uh, so there's a question here. In our group, someone asked, why Entebbe? Especially in light of an understanding that Entebbe may not be a good representation of other cities or conditions in the country. Uh, so Entebbe, um, as we contextualize, this, was, um, this dialogue was conducted in 16 African cities. And there was, um, there was a lot of uh, influence also from the Food and Agriculture Organization, but strategically for Entebbe, um, what was important is, uh, first of all, building upon work that we have done in Entebbe. Um, so this is not really the first project around food. So it's building upon the work that has been done with Entebbe municipality 
um, around climate, around energy, around um, around food. So, and I think Mr. Samakula will talk about this um, in the closing. So, but then I think we have to appreciate the strategic location of Entebbe um, as a peninsula. So, in a way, it is not representative. But in the discussions we've had that. Um, that Entebbe, when we're discussing food system, it is not limiting us to Entebbe as a city alone, but how Entebbe is linking to the larger country or to other major cities uh, within the region. So, and, and that's also a point well noted for future dialogues. Uh, how, how should we be able to, um, to link, for example, discussions that are local and then link them to, um, to, to more contextual or regional based so that we're able to capture other cities within, for example, Uganda, and it could also be another dialogue around the, the, the Lake Victoria Basin, so pulling in all these cities along the Basin. So thank you for that question, David. Um, and I, I, ho I hope I've been able to, to, to give you a bit of an understanding why Entebbe was, um, was a preferred choice. Uh, building on work that has Ikli and FAO have been doing in Entebbe, but then also due to the strategic location of Entebbe and the potential it has um, in driving a food system change. So thank you for that. And thanks, Lauren. So before I can hand this over to Mr. Samakula, because a lot of questions are coming up in our discussions um, in, in trying to understand, you know, when, when we are speaking about our issues around food system governance in Entebbe, um, because issues around the policy architecture is not strong or it's not, um, it's not being implemented in a systemic way to be able to drive, um, to, to drive food system change. And there are also issues around infrastructure. You know, there's potential for Entebbe to be a transportation hub but this is not being exploited to the maximum. So what role can the municipality play in, um, in, in driving some of this change? And of course, with infrastructure, you, you see that food is moving faster. Other, other, um, other needed resources are also moving faster across the region. And so we are able to, to for example, in, uh, increase economic dependence of independence, or first of all, the, the municipality, but then also the people within the municipality. And then we know the link between economic independence and access to nutritious food. Um, then issues around land. Um, I think this has come out quite strongly in the discussion. Uh, issues around access to land, but then also access to the land resources. And, and I think in one of the discussion rooms, uh, someone brought up the issue that now there's control of for fishing on the lake, and this is being uh, done at a national level. So as a city, um, how are you empowered to be able to support more access of the local communities to the lake, to be able to, to sustainably use the resources to empower themselves, but then to also access, uh, access food. And um, then um, issues around food sensitive about planning have been brought up. Um, linking, for example, the fact that Entebbe was planned as a colonial city, as an administrative city, um, where food was not exactly at the center of the city. So are there future plans of Entebbe, uh, future development plans, future urban plans, and uh, where does agriculture fall in these plans? Um, is the municipality planning to, um, what is the municipality prioritizing? Do we want more food intensively grown within the city or within, um, different institutions or within homes. So what is the plan around urban planning um, for cities that is favorable, first of all, to food, but then also to, uh, to furthering environmental sustainability and conservation of the lake. Um, then issues around access to food within Entebbe were brought up. And this, is, this was directly related to issues um, around food being expensive in Entebbe. And could this be that because most of the food is acquired outside of the Entebbe boundaries, um, could it be that um, the high levels of poverty within Entebbe, so people cannot access food? Uh, so, and really what are the plans um, around uh, bettering this situation uh, locally? Then agri promoting agroecology, I think this was also identified strongly, uh, promoting, um, promoting afforestation of the, lake, uh, of, the, of the lake buffer zones, so that, so, and this can also help, help in aiding uh, issues related to flooding. And I think importantly, um, issues of consumer awareness were also brought up. Uh, people should be made aware of, um, of what is good quality food, of what is safe food, of what food is acceptable, what food is nutritious, so that um, they're able to make informed decisions, informed decisions according to their levels of income, according to their levels of access to food. So these are some of the key issues coming up um, all through our discussion. And I may not have touched on, on, on most of them, but I think at this point is where we, um, we also want to hear from from um, from our official, from Mr. Semakula, is um, 
what are those priorities that the city is pushing and how are some of the issues that have been brought up um, able, where is the municipality at in, in trying to meet some of these issues or in trying to address some of these issues or in trying to build upon some of the opportunities uh, within, um, within the urban food system in Entebbe. So over to you, Mr. Semakula. And thank you everyone for participating in the discussions. Uh, we've had quite rich outputs and I may not have done them the best justice, but you can see that uh, some of the out outputs coming up, there's a lot of connectivity and issues being raised, even if some of these issues were addressed in different discussion groups. So thank you very much for that. So over to you, uh, Mr. Semakula, and then afterwards we'll have a closing from our co-convener, um, Richard, and then we'll uh, officially close our dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, the issues raised by the participants are pertinent, but uh, what I can really say is the, the history of the town also determining how the town was. And it was designed as a colonial seat for the government. And as such, the, the colonial masters designed it in a different way. So it has affected the, the, the development of, for instance, the, the transport infrastructure. But uh, another issue also is the, the setting of the uh, municipality. Like I've said, it's a, it's a, it's a peninsula. So like the, the, unless you take another route by water or by air, the, the land part of it ends there. So you find that uh, most of the, the produce that is imported into Entebbe, that is its final journey. That's why Entebbe has the, decided to set up a, a modern market, which has also validation facilities, so that you can bring in some, some agriculture stuff that you cannot really consume. Then we have to increase its shelf life, maybe by processing it a little bit and the storing it. So the market has the cold storage facility, it has the agro-processing center also to add value to the, to the produce. And then the transportation, the plan was to have a survey linked up by water to other towns, for instance, Ginger and Kampala mainly. But uh, it doesn't come to be seen because of the, the, the struggles that the country has come to right from the 70s. So some of those plans and the shelves that have not been implemented. I mean, you look at the lake and the water of a single boat, I find not even a canoe on the lake. We should be having, I mean, steamers and uh, other types of vessels going to different towns, one that's to some Kampala, but it has not happened. We just have a few ferries in the country in some places. We have only maintained the airport as a major hub for the country, the Ontario International Airport. However, the physical development plan for the 20 years to come as a water transport has a very big issue. To be handled. Then uh, the land, the land issue, the, the pressure on the land is quite high in Ontario because again it's a peninsula, it's 20 square kilometers, and that's it. You cannot expand, so you find that the land for agriculture doesn't compete well for, as compared to real estate. So most people prefer to use their land for real estate than growing crops or uh, rearing animals. So you find agriculture is always pushed out whenever there is a change, they always push out agriculture. And then um, on the lake access issue, there was a period of uh, bad fishing method. Like two years ago, the, the fishermen discovered that they could use cheaper methods using some chemicals to attract the fish and then they could get them easily as compared to the gill net. So there was a wave of the bad fishing method that prompted the government to institute some really strict enforcement. Actually, they used the army to patrol the lake and make sure that the, the fishermen uh, adhere to the, to, to the good fishing method. So it has somehow restricted the activities on the lake, but also we need to regulate the fishing. We should not fish the whole year round. We should wake up in the morning and go fishing the whole year round. I don't think it should be that way. We should give the lake some time to, to recover the stock. So that's what the government is trying to, to do. But you know, the lake is, is owned by more than uh, 
African country. Sometimes decisions take a long time to come to. Kenya has to do the same, Tanzania has to do the same, Rwanda has to do the same. So it's a bit, it's taking a bit of time to arrive at the fishing regulation issues. Then, uh, like I said, uh, we are really thinking about value addition in entering and storage and the processing and cultural products. Because we otherwise we are wasting a lot of it. That's why people think the entire is very expensive because when you buy some food stuff, when they bring some food stuff in the market, if you stop both, then it's it's, it's cut it off. So usually the prices are high by the suppliers because of the risk they they, they are facing because you can't when you reach entire you can't go through any further. So but we are promoting agro processing and the value addition. This new market has a very big facility for that. And um, the net importation also means that the entire people don't have much of More easily, the, the, the cost of the food, the food comes from the, the transport issues and the, how the middlemen place it. That's mainly how the, the, the residents will mainly set it up. So that's what I can say for now. Over to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And and I think importantly, what what you bring to the fore is the municipality alone may not even have the answers yet. But um, yeah. sort of bringing uh, how 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 can you work better, for example, with uh, with all the other uh, regions across the Lake Victoria, you know, to to um, to to govern, you know, how 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 fishing is going to be done. And, and then also issues around access to land, so peninsula with limited land. But I think also the question still remains is that how can, um, what, what, would, what, what are the opportunities present, for example, um, in helping more people access small portions of land and could be periodically. So I think it's, it's a very contested space, even in terms of the size of the peninsula with regards to the, um, to the requirement for food. But I think uh, moving forward is to understand how we can systematically move forward um, to, to ensure that uh, food, there's a food security myth, but then the environmental sustainability is also uh, being promoted. And I think all our partners here present are, 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 are looking forward to sort of support the city further to, to, to ensure this. And before I can, I can close, I want to, to hand over to our co-conveners, um, Richard and Marcy, to to also reflect on the process and uh, on some of the outcomes and and how uh, both the organizations are can support some of these processes uh, moving forward or some of the priorities identified moving forward. So over to you, Amasi, and then Richard. Then we can officially close um, our dialogue. So I'd like to request that maybe your contributions are up to the point. Uh, this will give us a chance to close at latest, at least uh, five minutes past at uh, twelve. And thank you very much for staying with us, everyone, till this far. Maybe over to you, uh, Marcy, or Richard. Uh, yeah, Richard, you've unmuted, then over to you then. Okay, yeah, I think uh, we have said it all during the discussions, but I just want to, first of all, thank you as Iklai, Africa, and then uh, thank Thomas Samson at uh, the Municipal Funds Municipality for the time that you have invested in, yeah, these hard times uh, to enable us to do it, because the food systems dialogue is going on even in, in our country here the, at the coordinated by the office of the prime minister. And uh, just two days ago, I attended one. And I think tomorrow there's another one around consumer, consumer rights and something. So I think that all of this, what we're discussing here can easily be, be taken up during this discussion. So it really opens up our eyes and we we'll continue taking this up. We also look forward to getting the outcome of this to feed into the, the national process, maybe formally uh, sent to the office of the prime minister, but also uh, to the FSS, of course, the, the, the global. But uh, we are very, as the Uganda coalition, we are very keen on, as I mentioned in the start, that we are very keen on track three, uh, on, na on nature, uh, on, the bo on, on boosting nature and, and positive production, but also building resilience, vulnerability to shocks and stress. And also we look forward to working together with everyone, uh, especially in, Lake, in relation to Lake Victoria uh, through, for example, our, our partnership on uh, forum on Lake Victoria that Lovra is probably going to talk about. We definitely build it up and think we can strengthen it. 
not to, to talk about fisheries also, but also forests, for example, if you had another forum on forest systems, wetland systems, water systems, you'll get a whole range of other issues around. So, uh, so thank you very much for this and uh, I wish you the, 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 the good day, the rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and for all the work in uh, in pulling together stakeholders in fa and facilitating, and then also uh, presenting. So it's it's been a rich program, and would not have achieved it without uh, without the support from you and David, as well as your whole organization, Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Masi. I'm not sure if uh, Masi is still with us, uh, but he's from he's from the uh, the Lake Victoria Regional Local Authorities Corporation, and they've also been very instrumental in in bringing together different stakeholders uh, for the dialogue and facilitating, as well as uh, contributing towards the presentation. And as you saw from his presentation, uh, this organization is quite key um, around issues around governance uh, in the Lake Victoria Basin and other regions. So I'd like to, to thank you all and thank you very much for the engagements to Entebbe City. Uh, thank you for hosting us and we we'll, we'll shall share the outcomes from this dialogue. Um, first of all, in the at, we shall upload the outcomes on the UN Food Systems Summit uh, website and we'll share with, uh, with you, Richard, to be able to carry this forward uh, to the office of the prime minister. So the outcomes from here, as well as uh, who was with us today in the discussions. And then we'll also share the links to the recording once they've been uploaded. I just want to thank all of you uh, present here. I'd like to thank Etere City. I'd like to thank the Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development and I love luck, as well as my team uh, for all the support. So thank you very much and have a good day, Father. And we hope we can stay in touch. Um, you all have our emails or you can get in touch with Sinetemba who, was, uh, who sent you the invitation emails uh, if you need to get in touch with us. Um, thank you very much and uh, we hope to stay in touch.